Okay. Um, can you shut this room? Can you shut this room? <coughs> I think. Let's finish with my. No, no, no. Shut this. Light. Roll. What are you doing? Why, why are you turning off the projector? All right. Um, are your friends coming or not coming? The rest of them. What happened? Still coming? Not coming? You, you know that you have um, left behind in terms of lectures, okay? That's why I want to um, start right, right away. Okay, so let's continue um, the lecture. So, um, <coughs> according to the lecture plan, you should be learning about what today? What? Is it a good idea these things too close for me? About what? Sound wall, yeah. We're going to learn about sound wall because it's actually the very thing that enable your plants to grow. I mean, visually, you see your crops, your trees are growing, but without the action of sand wall, that is actually not happening, okay? Because this is the direct impact of each individual plant cell. So it's only sensible to understand how this cell wall actually do the expansion and also elongation and it stops all right it doesn't get burst okay it's not going like it's going to expand indefinitely at one point it's going to stop all right so we're going to look at the structure formation and also um, the expansion all right so if you Remember from your um, taxonomic uh, lesson, there are a number of uh, kingdoms, correct? There are kingdoms that deals with animals, fungi, bacteria, plants, and, and also um, beings like protist, you know, paramecium. Yeah. Surprisingly, cell wall even though you always associate that with plants, that actually also present in other um, groups of, of lives, okay? So you have plants, of course, we are learning about that. Brown algae, got cell wall. Uh, uh, bacteria, got cell wall. Fungal, avilis, archaeobacteria, and, and so on, okay? Correct your understanding. I know that from school you have learned the, the one thing that distinguishes between animal and plant cell is the cell wall. Actually, there is a group of animal that has a cell wall. It's called a tunicate, okay? This um, animal here. And um, if you watch SpongeBob, this is actually um, one of the animals that happen in some episodes, it's called sea squirts. It's a marine, marine life, okay? And it belongs to the kingdom of protist. So the same kingdom as the paramecium, okay? You're familiar with paramecium, right? So it's the same um, uh, kingdom. Um, I'm not going to uh, go too much about, about this because we are more interested with the plant, right? So, Regardless of the occurrence of cell wall, 
in a cross of the kingdoms, the cell wall serve three fundamental functions that they regulate cell volume, okay, because they have the rigidity structure to it, determining cell shape, which is very important. Look at um, amoeba. It hasn't got any um, cell wall to it. So that's why amoeba can do phagocytosis, you know, engulfing its food by enclosing um, the appendages, right? And also, cell wall mechanically protecting the delicate protoplast. Protoplast, what is it? When you have a cell wall, so the cell here, this, so this is your cell wall, this is your plasma membrane. When you remove your cell wall, when there is no cell wall, this we call protoplast. Just the plasma membrane. Okay, so there is a technique in biotechnology, it's called protoplast fusion. You see, it's not easy to fuse two cells of plant from different genus readily because of this um, cell wall. But some scientists in the lab, they remove this cell wall to create protoplast of the plant cells and then they let, they let it fuse um, in vitro in the petri dish. So this way you can actually create hybridization. So protoplast fusion is a biotechnology technique. So you can get actually a new species by doing that. All right. So look at this brown pad. This is your cytoplasm, all the contents of your, um, of your cell, cell membrane, and then the polysaccharide. So cell wall actually is a combination of various form of polysaccharides. Get that information correct in your head first. Cell wall present in various kingdom. Regardless in the kingdoms, they are basically just polysaccharides. And there are many types of polysaccharides possible because there are many types of sugar. Okay? The sugar that you have learned. There are so many. Glucose, fructose, sucrose, and so on. So these different combination of sugar, simple sugar coming together homogeneously, or different sugar come together creating complex sugar, there are still sugar. So these different combinations can be present in polysaccharides. Even within the plant kingdom itself, the combination is countless. Okay, anything can happen. One important thing or component in the, in the cell wall is cellulose, okay? And this is why um, you are so familiar with the plant cell because you know plant has cellulose. It's a component inside the cell wall. Remember, okay, cell wall, it's got many things. One of the major things is cellulose. Can you... Eat cellulose. No. So you don't eat vegetable? You can eat cellulose, but you cannot digest cellulose because your digestive system is not equipped with cellulose. Right? However, this undigested cellulose fiber in your digestive tract will create a happy place for your gut microbes. Okay, so the fermentation that happens in your gut will create a very thriving uh, place for your gut microbiota to thrive in. And this actually has a very strong impact on your health. Okay, there is uh, some uh, technique in hospital. Um, when Doctors pretty much do not know what kind of medicine or drugs to give to the patient. It's pretty much 
hopeless cases. So one technique in hospital that people start to do more and more now, it's called, it's not organ transplant, but fecal transplant. So the fecal matter of a healthy individual is sampled and then, you know how they do it? They put it in capsule. They put it in capsule and then they let these very sickly patients to consume this. So that, imagine taking a vitagen, but vitagen only how many um, uh, bacteria in there. But if you get this healthy fecal matter from a very healthy individual, very soon, it's going to dominate your unhealthy gut and you will become healthy. Yeah, and the success rate for this is very high. I'm, I'm not sure about in Malaysia whether they do this or not. Yeah, but if you talk about it from the medical point of view, it's pretty much like giving the patients probiotic. And we take probiotic all the time, right? You drink Vitagen, you, you eat tempeh, kimchi, Right, what else? Um, sauerkraut, no sauerkraut? Um, kimchi, people put chili in it and put it in a jar, right? Sauerkraut, people don't do it, put a chili. They just put the, the brine, the salt water, so you get your sauerkraut, okay? So all of these are um, probiotics, so, so on. Uh, the same thing with the fecal matter, okay? So cellulose, it's not, for the purpose of our energy, the food, to become our food. But it's very much used directly in our daily lives. You can see there are various examples here. We use paper, sellotape, the sellotape that you use, that thing, even though it looks like plastic, it's actually cellulose. It's called, um, there's a word for that actually, regenerated cellulose. Okay, so a product like cellotape, um, rayon, they are not entirely synthetic. Okay, it's, it's a composite uh, product. They kind of combine natural and synthetic material together to give a more robust product um, strength, right? And also for various function, okay? Yeah. A cotton is for your shirt, yeah. Wood, that's, that's also cellulose, okay? And what else? For insulation. So you can see that wherever you go, whatever you do, cellulose is pretty much everywhere around you, okay? It's, it's going to be very hard not to touch cellulose on a daily basis, you will deal with cellulose, okay? So in some governments, which are very much into green energy, people are talking about cellulosic biomass because this can actually be turned into biofuels, okay? Some countries are very dedicated in doing this, but others are still, still struggling uh, about um, sentiment like food versus biofuel, okay? But fossil fuel is not going to be forever. So this is pretty much the way for um, solar system and so on, all right? Um, so if you can see this complementary side, I, I put um, some definitions to help you. Uh, with it, okay? I, I didn't have lots of time to find everything. I mean, like, you should find by yourself um, anyway, right? Okay, the functions of cell walls. We're talking about plants now. It, it pretty much for their mechanical strength because plants um, do not have bones like you, okay? So, I think in the first week, you learn about um, um, plants, the, the inside of the plant cell, it has got its own skeleton. What is it called? 
what? Inside the cell. Remember the cell got organelles, right? Beside organelles, what else is present? What? Spindle. Spindle fiber is 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 uh for the uh, cell division. Your organelles is not floating on air in your cell. It's actually sitting on something. What is it? It's a cytoskeleton, microtubules, okay, microfilaments, and so on. All right. So. How do you think the organelles move in the cells? Are they floating? So this ex, um, cytoskeleton, such as the microtubules, is the one that actually moves things around. All right? So it's a mesh of um, interconnected network inside your cell, both for animal and plant cells. Okay? Yeah. So. Due to this, cell wall enables plants, even though it hasn't got any bones, to go very high, to go very big. Okay? Look at some of the highest trees in the world here. I don't know whether you can see or not. I mean, like, if, you, if you have your notes, you can see it. So some of the plants here, like the giant sequoia trees, um, all of these belong to the family of pine. Okay? They are very tall, very old. This can be as tall as people keep updating about the, the height of this tree. It's about 120 meters now. 120 meters, um, it's like how many, how many stories? 35 stories building. So that's very high, 120 meters. Okay. And imagine that. 120 meters, the water and nutrients still can reach at the top. Even though the plant hasn't got any heart to pump. You are only this big. But you already need a pump. A energy demanding organ to pump the blood throughout your body. So it's very um, miracle, miraculous for, for the plants. To, to, to attain such a function, okay? And cell wall, it's not like plants, uh, animal cells. They are connected to each other. You are not going to find plant cell alone like that. No. If you find it this way, pretty much it's going to die. It's not like your, your uh, blood blood cell, your erythrocyte, okay? So the, the, the animal cell, they can just float in the medium, like plasma and so on, and then move from one place to another place. Your blood cells can travel. What, what else? What other cells that can travel? Plant cells can travel. They pretty much stay wherever they are. What are your other cells in your body that can travel. Right. Can you be born if the cell is not traveling? Sperm and ovum. That can travel. Right. It travels to a, such a great length. And this is not due to the circulation, like the red blood cells. Okay. What else that can travel? Some stem cell can actually travel, uh, I mean, between the baby and the mom, okay? Through the, the cord. What do you call the cord? You know biology better than me. So, yeah, so you get the idea. So, in between cell wall, so you have a cell wall here. Why this thing is not? There is a glue. They are glued together. The plant can decide whether to make this glue stays on or to remove this glue. 
And this is very important because when the plants decide to remove some of this glue, some of the cells can detach. And for the leaf, this can actually create air space. And very important for photosynthesis. Okay. Some locations, the detachment of the cells can happen completely to the point you can have a fallen leaf. Okay. And this is a special place. It's called the abscission layer for the leaf. Okay. So if the cell wall hasn't got this glue-like function, none of this could have happened. Bear in mind, even though they are detaching, it's not always completely. It's always connected to each other. Okay? Except in the case of leaf abscission. Okay? Leaf abscission, the moment the detachment happens, the wound here will heal. Will heal, uh, forming like a, um, what do you call that? Yeah, the kind of wound scrap. It's going to close so that there is no entry for the pathogen. Okay, right. So let's see what else for the cell fun cell wall function. Okay, so because of this function, the plant cells pretty much not easily to explode. Okay, when the water is scarce, you will see that the plant is wilting, okay? Pretty much doesn't look so happy. But when the water is ample and sufficient, it will look fresh again. But when the water is too much, as in the case of hypotonic solution, it's not going to burst the cell up. Your blood cells, if the hypertonicity or isotonicity of the plasma is not regulated, your blood cell will burst. Okay, there is a, there is a condition for that actually. <clears throat> so that's why our body is very busy regulating our salt concentration, glucose concentration and so on. Because your, the individual cells in your body do not have this cell wall to enable this plasmolysis and then deplasmolysis, right? Because of this strength as well, the plants can withstand such a great pressure to the point the water can travel along the vascular bundle such as the xylem. The pressure here is great. Look at the difference in the pressure here. At the root level, the pressure here is minus 0.3 megapascal. Still within the same tree, the top here is minus 100 megapascal. There is a big difference in that. Your body cannot handle this. You will pretty much collapse if you were to put in this kind of condition because we do not have the cell wall. Okay? So this is why... Um, Plants, they are able to transport water at such a great length while not breaking any conduit or tubing inside. Your blood vessel, the endothelial lining of your blood vessels, one of the reasons people have degenerative disease when they, are, they get older, because they have lost the elasticity of the blood vessels, okay? Ever heard of atherosclerosis? Okay, the building up of the plaque inside your blood vessel. So you have your blood vessel, and then you have the plaque building up. One reason is because your blood vessel stiffen up. Just, it just got hardened with time, okay? It's just not elastic. So the plants, they don't really have this, this, this problem, okay? They can pretty much um, regulate 
the needs of this vessel to become porous or impermeable depending on the situation. Because in plants, for a given piping system, they always have two. They have the xylem and the phloem. Deals with water, deals with large molecules and ionic charges. So they have specialized conduit or tubing to deal with various compounds. Your blood cells don't get to choose that. They have to deal with everything. You see, when there is a lot of cholesterol and fat running in your blood, it's super heavy, right, that thing. It will deposit to the wall of your blood vessel. If it were in the plants, the plants, maybe the fat is not a good place to be in the xylem, so the fat will be handled by the phloem because the phloem has what? They have living cells. They have the companion cell. Companion cells got energy to move bigger molecules against concentration gradient or following concentration gradient. Your blood vessel do not have that, right? All right, okay, what else? Yeah, cell function. This is very relatable to agriculture and also horticulture, of course. What are they? Cell wall actually create barriers between the environment and also the inner side of it. Pretty much your skin. Did you know that skin is your largest organ? Your skin is actually your organ, okay? And then it is the first defense against uh, any pathogenic attack. <coughs> so plants also have this, but the skin of the plant is a lot more modified than what you have, okay? So the cell wall, it can give the chemical barrier and also the physical barrier. Chemical various things that being secreted by the plant surface, like the latex, oil, resin, and various sticky compounds. Um, you know, mint, the mint leaf, people extract that to turn into essential oil, correct? We use that as essential oil, but that's actually the plant's chemical barrier, okay? Um, what do you call it? This chemical. Her. I need to get a new red markers. Herbivory deterrent. Uh, what else? Uh, lemongrass. All these plants with smells, the moment the plants are eating it up, you go to ah, what what taste is this? Okay, many animals they don't care about the bitterness. Maybe they don't have the taste bud for bitterness, but they function, they respond very well to these various organic compounds. Okay, and also the physical barriers. Okay, so cell wall can modify itself, and also it can um, have an outgrowth. Like in the case of um, epidermal cell. Epidermal cell is the outermost layer of the cells, okay? Epi, it's just right at, on the edge. Epidermal cells happen in various locations in the plants. In the location in the root, epidermal in the root, it can modify itself to form a projection. You find this epidermal in the leaf as well, but it hasn't got this. So this root project, projection, known as the root hair. And this is for the purpose of nutrient absorption. Okay? So, for nutrient and water. The same epidermal cell, but in different organ, in the leaf, it can modify itself. to become trichome. Still looks like a hair, but is the function the same? Is it the same? For this guy is for what? 
again for this herbivory deterrent and also to um what's the word impede i think i think the word is impede like to slow down um fung fungal penetration you see fungus has this hyphae right the roots the roots of the fungus we fungus you don't call roots you call hyphae okay so this hyphae they come together in a mass you, you call it mycelium so to prevent you have your leaf to prevent fungus from getting all across your leaf your leaf has this hair so when you this hair it's like a roadblock it prevents the fungus from dominating the leaf so that the leaf has time to call for help you know did you know leaf can call for help first it can call help from within itself like secreting um, chemical or something another is it can secrete substance to call for the natural predators of the the whatever is invading at the moment okay so this signals is airborne right so plants never alone in nature yeah they're, they're all always um, communicating with each other all right so now i hope you can appreciate the cell wall now all right the 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 important uh reasons of the cell wall actually not only to provide uh, the shape for the plant cell but for the protection strength and also the connection okay and this is pretty much governed by the composition in in the cell wall okay and which we would be going to look at um today and let's start with this one first if you have printed your book um so you can see that much of this picture is actually in the book okay if you still cannot catch up the way this class is conducted the reason i give you the book is so that you can have a scan read first you are not going to understand all of this thing in one go i do not know how many times i have read all of this like like over the years okay all right so cell wall number number one that you need to understand is depending on the location all of these are plant cells all of this but depending on the location and maybe the age of the plant cells the thickness of the plant cell is never the same okay some cells have thin cell wall moderate thickness of cell wall and also very thick cell wall okay and these actually correlate to various type of tissue so you, i hope you still remember from your botany lesson so you have the ground tissue which is called the parenchyma tissue colenchyma tissue and sclerenchyma tissue so you can see that for the ground tissue the parenchyma tissue the cell wall is rather thin okay it's rather thin then you have the colenchyma tissue the cell wall start to thicken a bit and then you have the third type of tissue which is the sclerenchyma tissue it's very thick not not only that it's thick it's actually depositing something else in the cell wall like the lignin okay and from here and forward where you get the wood we're not going to deal a lot with wood because this is not faculty of forestry wood there is a, a lesson for that we call dendrology okay faculty of forestry they deal with this okay for agriculture we only deal up to this point okay we don't really deal with woods because woods um it's got its own anatomy and various things to worry about right okay so i've got um one uh, one type of cell here the stomata cell in two plant system 
the monocot plant and also the dicot plant. Monocot is represented by the what plant is this? Rice. Rice. And this is Arabidopsis. <coughs> um, we we don't really use Arabidopsis here, but in in other developed countries, they use Arabidopsis heavily because this is the model plant. The first plant to be completed its genome sequencing is Arabidopsis. The first plant. That's why Arabidopsis is used to represent dicot plant system. Okay, model plant for dicot. And model plant for the monocot is rice. Okay. So these are the stomata for two uh, plant systems. So the stomata looks different. They are both stomata, but they look different. The stomata for rice, we call the dumbbell shape. The guard cell. So, sorry. So you have stomata. Sto, stoma is the singular. Stomata is the plural. It's a Greek, means mouth. It's actually the combination of pair of gut cell. Pair of gut cells. And the gut cell can have different morphology. Okay? For in the case of rice, oh, that looks not so nice. So this is for rice, we call it dumb bell shape for rice. For the Arabidopsis, we call it the sausage shape or the kidney bean or the kidney, kidney shape. A pair of these, this is gut cell, okay? This is gut cell, this is gut cell. A pair of these will make a stomata. And this, the hole in the middle here, we call it what? Aperture. Let your camera, your eyes got aperture, right? This is the opening. This whole thing, aperture. Uh, I'll, I'll make it aperture T U R E. So aperture plus gut cells, you get your stoma. Okay, stoma stomata is actually a collection of various components come together. Okay, so look at this. Um, this mapping here, the heat map down here. This is actually to show you the wall stiffness and the red in this diagram here it shows you the cellulose you can see that the cellulose um, distribution is not even in this cells this is the point i'm trying to make not only that this the thickness of the cell wall is different depending on the tissue even within the same plant cell, the distribution of the cellulose is not homogeneous. Some site actually has more cellulose than the other. Like in the case of rice, you have more cellulose um, near the aperture, right? So this is why when photosynthesis is actively happening, the cell, the guard cell can swell and forming the opening like that if the cell sorry if the cellulose is evenly distributed you don't get this opening you pretty much if it swell it's going to swell just get bigger you know like like a bread sandwich right yeah. and this is for the um, um, arabidopsis okay and when you look at the the thickness, you can see that the thickness near the aperture is actually more. 
for both of the plant species. Okay, so it shows you cell wall contains cellulose and the cellulose, it's never be the same because it can control what the cells can do. Okay, in addition to controlling the shape of um, uh, the plant cell. Oh, sorry. All right. So this would be this figure. When you read journal, when you read book, you are going to find this a lot from now on. People use microscope all the time. I just want to highlight you with these three important microscopes when you when you learn uh, deep about about plant science okay so the first image is actually called the nomarski microscope or dic in some some book nomarski is the name of the guy who who created this nomarski um, the official name is dic differential interface contrast um, it basically view your 2D specimen, but in your eyes, it appears 3D. No coloring. Sometimes it's not possible to color your plant tissue. Okay? But this DIC or Nomaski microscope, if you, you just want to study the surface of it, you can use this microscope. Okay? Just a microscope like this. So it's like a regular microscope, but it's equipped with this prism. Okay? So a, some prism is equipped in the microscope so that you have this 3D looking, non-coloring specimen. All right? So in this case, you can see um, this is actually, what picture is that? Surface view of cell wall fragments of onion. Yeah, good. You're working with onion. Okay. So you can see this is the onion cell. Okay. Another type of cell is called another type of uh, view. Still, you're still dealing on the surface, but this time you're dealing with different kind of microscope. This is called AFM, Atomic Force Microscope. So this microscope, it looks like, uh, do you know in the old time, people have the black disc to read the record, listening to the song, that thing that goes, what is it called? Gra gramophone, I think people call it. Yeah. This microscope has this platform and needle and your sample on top of it. It will read the surface of it. So whether the surface is stiff or soft, this will determine what is the picture that you're going to look like okay so it's not completely look the picture directly with your eyes but the microscope do some kind of some kind of computation if it's crushing it without much force it knows that place is softer okay so softer place usually it is raised deeper, harder surface, usually, you know, you look pretty much like this, forming like a groove like this, all right? Okay. And then a third type of microscope, this microscope here, the picture here, this is called the image from the electron microscope, okay? So this electron microscope, it can go into higher magnification. Pay attention to the scale here. This is 23 micron. Do you know how small is micron? Look at your ruler. Your ruler has one millimeter, right? Yeah. 1,000 micron make one millimeter. So it's very small. Yeah. <clears throat> and this guy here, 200 micrometer. And this is one micrometer. So with this electron microscope, you can see um, this is actually not a regular um, electron microscope. Actually, this is called TEM. Um, that picture here is called TEM. There is two. The one that we have in, in botany lab is called SEM. 
This is scanning electron microscope. T is transmission electron microscope. So this TEM can go deeper, higher magnification. So you can see that the cell wall actually ha is having various layer. It's not like a one homogeneous layer. Okay, it has got the inner wall layer and also the outer wall layer and then the cuticle. All right. When you look like this, it's boring, right? That's why scientists re-illustrate and then put it in your textbook so it looks like cartoon. So there, all the cartoon that you see in your textbook, the colorful depiction drawing, actually come from this kind of image, right? Okay, and then the secondary cell work. So um, when you have a cell like this, the the layer inside here you already have your cell wall right you have your cell wall here the plasma membrane can actually create another layer so as if you have a double layer in between the two cells remember okay um cell wall it doesn't come from thin air. The plasma membrane is the one turning out all the material to make it. All right. <clears throat> so you can see here, um, this is your parenchyma cells. And then these are your um, colenchyma and also the sclerenchyma. Okay. And in this picture here, you can see this is the primary cell wall. You can see the very thin outline here. And then whatever that you have in this thick region is actually your um, um, secondary cell wall, All right? The color, the difference of the color shows you that um, this is actually a type of uh, staining actually some amount of material has actually presence in the cell wall. It's called lignin. Okay. Primary cell wall usually do not have much lignin in it. That's why in this picture, you don't see red. In this picture, it's highly lignified. That's why it becomes red. Right? Yeah. <coughs> so Membrane, this layer here, and then you have your primary cell wall and also your secondary cell wall. This bob bubble's head, you know, like a plug that you see here, this is called um, cellulose synthesis. This is the machine that makes cellulose to create your cell wall. Okay, so it creates the primary cell wall first. Over time, as the plants get older and bigger, it will deposit another layer of cell wall. Okay, so if you were given a question and you need to label, remember that the primary cell wall is outside. It starts with the middle lamella. Whatever beyond here is new cell. Okay, from the top, middle lamella, primary cell wall, secondary cell wall, and only you will see your plasma membrane, right? Okay, we look a bit deeper, the, the components, individual components of the cell wall, very important because this will determine how your crop grow. Without this understanding, you will never understand why when you spray hormone, your plants get bigger, why with the occurrence of light your plants get taller you'll never understand why so the cell wall are made of cellulose first component 
gel metrics and cross links. Cross link actually comes together with the proteins. Okay, cross link plus proteins. Okay, so these three components. Please remember this: cellulose, gel metrics, and cross links proteins. Okay, in essence, cellulose is the fiber in the cell wall. Gel metrics is the soup that it gets Im embedded on, okay? And cross-link proteins is actually um, the thread or the tip that bind everything together, okay? You have different materials, different kind of sugar. Some of this sugar, they naturally don't get attracted to each other, like magnet, soft and soft. So cross-link will bind them together. Like you have a number of bands and then you put a rubber band. Yeah, that rubber band is the cross-link. Okay. Sugar, please understand. There are many types of sugars. M many many, stu many students, I think, they have a bit difficulty to understand this because um, in in agriculture, people people don't really talk about this sugar. You you only know the sugar as in the form of glucose, sucrose, fructose, that kind of sugar. Okay. Actually, there are many more, and they can easily change with the splitting of the sugar. Okay. What you need to understand is the sugar is determined based on the number of carbon. As simple as that. The number of carbon will determine whether it is a hexose sugar, a pentose sugar, and then you have another group called the acid sugar, sugar with some oxygen lost, and sh sugar in the form of couple, di sugar or disaccharide. Six carbon sugar, five carbon sugar, acid sugar, deoxy sugar, and disaccharide sugar. How many groups are there? One, two, three, four, five. Five. Get this in your head first. There are five groups of sugar, at least when you're dealing with cell wall. Okay. <clears throat> so hexose, you've got things like galactose, glucose, mannose, pantose, you got the xylose, arabinose, apios, okay? And then you have your acid sugar, galacturonic acid, then the oxy sugars, you got the rhamnose, and then the salivarose, you get, um, this is actually two glucose, two glucose you join together, it's called um, salivarose. Okay, so I, I put it here, this is not part of the book, but I just, I just put it here for you. When they are single molecule, you have the OSE ending. Okay, single sugar, single glucose. You see? OSE ending. When they are in the form of polymer, it's called what? Look at polymer. Poly means many. Mer means unit. So polymer can be anything. It can be plastic polymer. It can be sugar polymer. It can, it can be um, nucleic acid polymer. Nucleic acid polymer. What is it? Your DNA, right? Okay, and you will see this is true for various um, uh, other other sugar, but sometimes the um, sugar can becomes in the form of branching. You will see in the books. I just want to um, show something. Um, the way you know. When you have a branching sugar, you always have 
this thing backbone and then the branch how do you know based on the name which one is the backbone which one is the branching i'll give you one example it's called um xylopen okay the final name here this is your backbone xylo this is actually the branch okay and xylose from the sugar xylose glucan is made from the many 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 glucose unit and the combination is endless there are many many kind of sugar and guess what it's different in all species even within the same plant so the plants decide what kind of sugar it wants to put in the cell wall that is the whole point depending on the age of the cell wall the location of the cell wall the function of the cell wall the plants decided it's never the same all right all right okay so what actually are cellulose well, it's actually a fiber, okay? A fiber. It starts with this, cellulose molecules. Single glucose. Two glucose together, it becomes the cellulose. I should put a double here. Double or pair equals Cellulose. This is only special for glucose. Okay, other sugar you don't get this um uh, a naming. So this cellulose, uh, sorry, this glucose polymers, they are going to stacking upon each other. Remember, you 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 learn about the DNA packaging. From DNA, you got your nucleosome. From nucleosome, you got your chromatin. That kind of packaging, yeah, it's happening again here. So, this crystalline cellulose, it will become in this way, and then surrounding it, it will be encased by paracrystalline cellulose. Paracrystalline cellulose, meaning that the cellulose is not purely glucose something else might be attaching to it para means partial partial cellulose okay and then this on the outside here the third layer here you're going to see that it's going to be wrapped with hemicellulose okay so these three things just going to right here because you need to get this terminology correct. So you have your the first one crystalline cellulose plus what paracrystalline cellulose then you plus hemicellulose these together will make a unit of what micro fibril remember the microscope images that you see you didn't see this you didn't see the crystalline um, cellulose what you saw just now on the image of this microscope here this thing here actually you saw this microfiber that's the big one the big guy so understand this in your cell wall the cellulose is actually in the form of bundle and that bundle is called microfibril. 
please don't get confused with microtubule, okay? Microtubule is the cytoskeleton inside your cell. It's different thing. Microfibril is a bunch of cellulose components come together. Yeah. Oh, I put a definition here. You see, I'm so nice. I've found a definition for you so that you don't have to, to uh, type one by one uh, on, on the, uh, on the uh, Google search. All right. Oh, I got, suddenly I got lazy. Actually, I wanted to put a, a, a number of glossary for you. Then I, I just thought at two. I said, oh, shouldn't you be more hardworking than me? So you got your glucan. Actually, I, I've, I've explained that to you. And the cellulovirus, yeah. Um, glucose, uh, you'll find this, uh, it's got a um, different side of it. It's got the left side and the right side. Uh, you should recall your biochemistry, okay? And this is called enantiomer. Oh, sorry, I don't want to tell this. If I tell too much, faculty will make me teach biochem. Better don't. Better don't. Yes, this I want to show. So these different combinations of sugar will make you have various kind of polysaccharides. Polysaccharide is just a general terminology. Depending on the members inside the polysaccharide, you will have various kinds. You can have cellulose if it's entirely glucose. So these are the legend, okay? Glucose, um, fucose, galactose, and xylose. So if it's just glucose, you get cellulose. If you have the backbone is glucose and then the branching, what are the branching? Look at the branching here. It's a xylose. I think I just put it, give it a right. Yeah, this one, this guy. The glucan, which is the polymer of glucose, is the backbone, the ending of it. And the front name is the branching. So this here, the example I give here, is actually the B, this guy. Right? And then what else? Um, you got your um, glucan. You got your heterozylon, homogalacturonin, and and so on. There are so many types. You don't have to remember all of this. I just want to tell you this thing actually present. And you might be sitting on it, wearing it. Can you know exactly each crop vegetable has which sugar? It's going to change all the time. So I have a feeling, it's just my hypothesis, you know some vegetables taste better than other vegetables? Like salad, choy sam. You, got, you, you, you like choy sam or pak choy? <laughs> oh, you don't, 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 don't <laughs> like neither. You know some people like, like uh, uh, some people don't like this. They like kailan. I have a feeling these vegetables actually have different combination of sugar. And some combination of sugar is just like by human taste. Look at all this sugar. Yeah. So if you do breeding, maybe you look one vegetable that people like the most, and then you study the components of the cell wall, see what sugars are in there, and then you breed for a vegetable that has the sugar that people like the most. You see, you just created a product of new breed, breeding line, something like that. Physiology is the is the the base, the fundamental. From this, you can go to various plant disciplines, right? Okay, the second component inside the cell wall, the gel matrix. So, number one, understand. Depending on whether you're talking about the plants or you're talking about the seaweed, the plants, the gel matrix. So what, uh, by the way, what, what is this gel matrix? So gel matrix is basically the soup. So you have your microfibrils, this thing. This thing is not floating on the air. It's actually in something. It's in the soup. Actually, in this case, it's in the gel. And this gel is actually, if it's in plant, it is packed in. If it's in seaweed, it's alginate. 
if you are into baking some of you maybe you like to make your own jams you will put pectin powder because it's a gelling agent and guess what pectin is obtained in here right in the middle here middle lamella so you got your pectin yeah so this actually has purpose in product i mean like, of course the plants use it as the components for cell wall but we actually harvest this okay to make products like the jam and also ice cream and there are many more some pharmaceutical company turn it into capsule okay so cell wall not only that you use for your clothes your house building material but it's even in your food you cannot digest cell wall the correct thing is you cannot digest cellulose but you still can eat the second components of the cell wall which is gel matrix right okay right look at this so this is a com the common pectin and the difficult name is homogelateronan look what's in the middle here what is it calcium <clears throat> this is why calcium is needed for plant without calcium you cannot have cell wall how many essential elements are needed for plant for a healthy growth how many 17 one of them is calcium right this is why without calcium this middle lamella cannot form properly and calcium in this region it has got a special name it's called calcium pectinate look at the name pectin this guy yeah. do you need calcium for, for, for what? Yeah. So this the plant made a uh, calcium for strong cell wall. <laughs> yeah. So maybe sometimes if you look at your plants and your plants is not looking happy, sometimes it's not nitrogen. Okay, people like to just give the MPK fertilizer, right? The symptoms manifested by the plants, sometimes it's not due to MPK. Okay. Sometimes it's due to the calcium. The plants have enough MPK, but it just cannot build proper cell wall. So by giving cell um, calcium, it's going to help your crop a lot. Because of one re reasoning, calcium is immobile. This is another reason. In immobile. You know, some elements are mobile and immobile, right? This is why calcium is immobile because it is embedded in the pectin in this formation. Nitrogen is mobile, right? Okay, and then this is the third component, the crosslink cell wall. Two components, hemicellulose and lignans. Okay, depending on the species of the plants, in Arabidopsis, it is mostly xyloglucan. In grasses, it is arabinoxylan. So if the name is arabinoxylan, what is the backbone of this sugar? This arabinoxylan. You just learned the formula, right? If the name of this polysaccharide is arabinoxylan, what is the backbone of this sugar? Xylan. What is the single unit of xylan? Xylose. Okay. And what is the branching of this sugar? Arabinose. Arabinose. Okay. Yeah. So this crossling pretty much 
tie up everything and also it cement the whole thing in the case of lignin. Okay, and this is the lignin. I don't worry too much about the name. So it's just the, the, the compounds that make the lignin is called these um, monolignols. So this would be on this page here. I think, I don't know where, where have I gone? You know, I'm worried whether you can understand this or not, whether you can follow this or not. If you go to, you know, a broad university, nobody cares about this. People just dump this book to you, read. Nobody cares whether you understand or not. So this would be, I think it should be figure 14.22 in this book. 14.22, this, 14.22a. So this is the, the actual um, compound of this monolignols. Okay. Yeah. All right. That is all to the components of the cell wall. Okay. So just to recap, cell wall, three components. What are they? Cellulose, gel matrix, cross links, and proteins. Okay. All right. Cellulose is the fiber thing, very strong. Gel matrix is the soup containing pectin and all alginate for the seaweed. And the cross link, hemicellulose and lignin, provide strength and knit the wall together. All right? Okay. So for the protein, I told you there is a protein as well, right? In that. Um, sometimes the protein is more, sometimes it's less. It depends on the species. But these are basically the, the protein, non enzymatic protein. When it says non-enzymatic, meaning that this protein is not involved in reactions. You, you know, so, so many proteins, they are actually involved in reactions to, to make something else, but not proteins in the cell wall. They're pretty much dormant. Okay? All right. Okay. Okay. One hour. Are you good? Are you good? Okay. Need to breathe. Okay, so that's the first part, and then we're going to deal with the second part, which is the growth of your cell wall. Any question? All good? Cellulose, it's purely glucose. Hemicellulose, look at the word, hemi, it's partially cellulose, meaning that something else might be present in the glucose polymer. Yeah. Um, I, let me see, check. Uh, okay. You can see this, right? This is this is this this is um. I think no, not this one. Like, if it's only cellulose, you see there is no branching here. Purely glu cell, uh, glucose units stacking upon each other. But the moment you have something else, it can be anything. In this case, it's xylose. So this, when it comes together, will create hemicellulose. In a way, it is still cellulose because you have this polymer of glucose, this, this, this green here, you see? One line of glucose, many, many, many glucose, that is still cellulose, okay? When they come together, many of them come together, you will have the crystalline cellulose. But for hemicellulose, you don't have this crystalline, but you have the branching. So that's why it's called hemicellulose, partially. Okay. Okay. Good. Are you okay? Okay. Have you learned this before? I know you have learned about cell wall. Have you learned about the components of cell wall? Too much. Okay. I'll try to finish this in half an hour. Let's see whether I can do it or not. 
Um, so in this book, it should be starting from page this page, three nine four. Yeah. Um, plant cells. I'm not, I'm not even talking about the growth or expanding just yet. Plant cell inside of it. It's not a very comfortable place, at least in our human sense. Okay? Because in plant cell, you have this protoplast, right? In this protoplast, it is jammed with many stuff. You have your organelles, you have your water, you have your sugar, you have your protein, your DNA, you got everything in there. So when you have all of this stuff, it creates a lot of pressure, okay? Without the presence of cell wall, your plant cell definitely will burst, okay? The pressure is so much, that's why, that's why I put this. Have you seen this before? Oh, nobody drive. If you drive, you should so it's really. Or maybe no, nobody go to the petrol station to pump the tire. Okay. Usually we use these units, right? The PSI or KPA unit. The bar is actually in, in other country. Okay. The bar in your tire, I'm talking about the pressure now in your tire, this tire here. Or oh, not this tire, this tire is already burst. It's about two to three bar. Okay. And that's your tire is already highly pressurized. If it bursts, is it going to produce a loud sound? Because it is so high pressure in there. It is so high pressure, it, it can withstand the heavy you and your friends and your stuff that much. What if, if you go over the limit? You keep on pumping. Well, actually, it's not going to happen, in, in, at least in our country, because we have a safety system in, 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 the, in the pumping um, uh, device. Okay? But it actually can burst. Look at the plan. 10 bars. Three, four times even higher than what your car tires have. So the pressure in plant cells is, is no easy business, okay? And this image here that I put in the leaf, you can see that from the base of the leaf, from the base to the top, you can see that around the 10, five to, five to 10 centimeters, this area is the most pressure. And then it gets lower. So the pressure in the leaf is not homogeneous. Okay? It depends on the distance from the leaf stalk, the petiole. Okay? But do you see your plants popping and bursting? Why? Why is it not bursting? Sour. Sour. Yeah, so you just learned the components of a cell wall now. It is so good, even your tire cannot compete with that. Right? Yeah. A little bit of the confusion. The pressure on a plant cell is negative. Oh, yes. Um, pressure, pressure, pressure can, um, it's, it's, it can be negative because the presence of impure water, meaning that the water in the plant here, it has got lots of solute, okay? If you have less solute, it will approach zero. Pure water, pure H2O, nothing else, the pressure is zero. That's why you always see plant pressure always negative because the impurities in the water, such as the solute, salts, protein, sugar, whatever, 
it will decrease the water potential. Is it going to dry soon? So that's why it becomes negative. All right. Can can what can this become positive? Yes, due to gravity. If you push it, you have a. Remember, you apply the GA with to your onion. You use what? Shrink. That shrinks actually put positive pressure. So, in that moment, it's positive. Okay. All right. So you have your growth and expansion. Okay. The the thing that you should bear in mind now is depending on the type of the cells, it has habits of growing. Two types. It's called the tip growth and also the diffuse growth. The tip growth you only have this with the pollen tubes and root hairs, just two cells, okay? The majority of the cells inside, your, inside the plant is actually having this diffuse growth, okay? And diffuse growth, uh, this is the depiction, okay? And some very small, maybe 1% of the plants, having super specialized cells, like the fiber cell, the scleric cell, and the trichome cell, they have the combination of both the tip growth and also the diffuse growth. They're kind of intermediate. Okay? So, since diffuse growth is the most growth that the plants have, that's what we're going to look at today. Okay? The pressure in plants, it's being exerted in all direction, radially, in all direction, okay? So, by logic, your plant should get, the cell should get bigger evenly, right? So, if it, this is your plant cell, if the pressure is the same, it should get bigger like this, right? evenly becomes bigger but this is not the case okay some plants they have this polygonal shape and many plants you're going to see the cell the, the plant cell they're going to be elongated meaning that they're going to grow more on this side the length not so much on the width and this growth is called an isotrophic growth. If it's isotropic in all directions evenly, it's called isotropic growth. Isotrophic growth. But for plant, it's an isotrophic. One of the reasons you can see, look at the thickness of the cell wall here. It's uneven. That's one of the reasons why the growth of the plant, instead of getting bigger evenly, they're just getting taller, elongated. We're going to see why. Number one is due to the orientation of microfibrils. Okay? Get into your head. When I say microfibrils, I'm talking about all of this together, okay? And all of this guy embedded in the gel. What's the name of the gel? Pectin, okay? There are many bundles of these microfibrils, okay? So the microfibrils, if it were to arrange randomly, you are going to get isotrophic growth like this. But since it is arranged in the transverse, meaning that horizontally, stacking one upon another, more than one side, that's why you get this an isotropic and elongated growth. So the arrangement of microfibrils, the, cellul the cellulose, is very important. 
Okay, it's not random, but it's in the transverse um, arrangement like this. This is important, especially when the seed is germinating. You can see that the seed, when it's germinating, is going so high. It, it, it looks very slender, very flimsy. It, it just doesn't care. Why? Why, why does it link grow very fast to become super tall? Yes, to get sunlight. In this case here. So the hypocotyl, cotyl refer to the cotyledon, which is used to be here. Hypo means below the cotyledon. So an isotropic elongates this hypocotyl so that the seedlings can reach out before the food reserve is used up to photosynthesize. Okay, one reason why isotrophic growth is very important. You have um, an isotrophic growth as well. Look at yourself. Are you like a ball or look, look like a tree? That's an isotrophic as well. Ever see your friend look like cube? So you also have an isotrophic growth, okay? So, and this actually helps the plants to photosynthesize very quickly to get, to get all the nutrients and then to get all the light. Because the moment the food reserve is all used up, as long as the light is present, the plant is autotrophic. It can make its own food, right? <clears throat> okay. Okay. So, what is the evidence that this is actually happening? Okay. So, this is a growing plant just now that you saw. So, in this um, in this paper, um, this paper actually in the uh, folder, um, it's it's by this this lady, um, Shoban Braybrook. So. I, I did learn with her. Well, not not learn, just 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 a few 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 lecture. So she's one of the leading scientists in the world when it comes to plant growth and cell wall development. Okay, um, she is um, BFF Andy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So in this experiment. They label the plant from number one all the way until number 11. And then they measure the cell length and cell width for 48 hours. Okay. So you can see that the cell length actually becomes more and more apparent, more than the cell width. Look at the scale here. The scale here all the way until 4,000. Look at the cell width. Hardly any changes. So this shows you a strong and isotrophic growth, okay? And for this um, uh, graph here, you can also see that this is the ratio between the length and the width. It is isotrophic growth if the ratio is one, okay? So you can see that, um, for example, this guy here, at number one, number one means the cell number one. When you leave it for a few hours, all the way until 48 hours, it becomes more and more an isotrophic. In here, approaching to one, it is isotrophic. It is basically a cube, but it elongates. As it elongates, that's why the shape and isotrophy ratio becomes higher. All right. So, why 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 this is happening one of the reason is like i said before is the arrangement of microfibrils so how do these microfibrils know to align themselves horizontally like in the picture earlier this is actually being governed by uh, this is why you have to learn microtubule this guy here mt 
microtubule. So this microtubule act like a rail track. Your train is cellulose synthase, this guy. Cellulose synthase will clamp to the microfibril. Remember, okay, they are in different location. Microtubule inside your cell. Cellulose synthase, it's in, in, the, in between the plasma membrane and also the outer side of it. So your microfibril is your rail track. Your cellulose synthase is your thread. So as it moves across the rack, it will churn out. Your train churning out what? It release what? Choo -choo. It release what? Smoke, right? So in this case, no smoke coming out. What's coming out? Cellulose. Because this is cellulose synthase. So this is the guy who makes this. This is what I said earlier. Your cell wall, the manufacturer is plasma membrane. This is one. Okay. So this guy, as it moves, it will produce these fibers of cellulose. That's why you get this orient the three orientation, horizontal orientation, is not instead of random orientation. Okay. And this has been proven by this fluorescent electron microscopy. So A in here, actually this image should be first actually. So this green here, this is the microtubule that has been labeled with a special dye. So it fluoresce glows in green. And this blue here, you kind of see the same Pattern, right? Actually, this is not microtubule. This is actually, can you see it? I want to get this um, cellulose microfibrils. This thing. This is inside of the cells. This is in the middle and outside the cell. So it is the copy image, meaning that they are in the same location. So this is the proof. Microtubules dictate cellulose orientation, All right? Yeah. And if you look at this image, you can see all the fibers, they are going in one direction. They are not in scattered direction, All right? Okay. And one important thing is, another important thing is, this um, microtubule, you know that microtubule determines cellulose orientation. It is not entirely up to the epidermis cell, epidermal cell, this one. The one that gets labeled here is the epidermis cells, but it's actually the cells behind it, the cortex cells. The cortex cells actually exert more power in determining the cellulose arrangement. Okay? So, in the epidermis, you can see that some of the microfibril micro still in the form of zigzag. They are not, they are not completely um, uh, transverse arrangement. But the cell behind it, the cortex, 100%, almost 100%, uh, transverse, horizontal arrangement. And rem rem remember, cells are always connected because the cortical cells, the cortex cells, is right next to the epidermal cells. It influences the epidermal cells to have this dominant cellulose transverse arrangement. And because of this, that's why it can have this elongated um, growth and isotropic growth. Okay, so so there, there is a small experiment here. What happens if you disturb microtubule? This is why microtubule is very important. And maybe if you are dealing with weak signs, create a herbicide to disturb microtubule. When you, you disturb microtubule, instead of elongating elongated tissue like this, you get like bulbous head of tissue. 
it just cannot elongate properly okay yeah so this shows again the arrangement of the mic both microtubule and microfibules and this image has been superimposed um together all right yeah all in the hope to be have this arrangement just that okay Another thing is, if the cellulose has been arranged in transverse horizontal manner, if the cell wall is not loose, I mean like everything, everything is still tight, the still can still cannot grow. This is when auxin comes into place. You, you remember? You learn auxin, right? So this is in the action of auxin. Okay. Oh, there's a long story here. Can you just read and be know about it? <laughs> so in essence, the auxin will cause um let me let me find this. Um this image has two letters um sequence. Okay, you have this A B C, the capital A B C, and also the small A B C all the way until K. So A, B, C, capital, it shows the sequential progress of your cell visually. The lowercase A, B, C, all the way until K, it shows the steps happening for the auxin to enable uh, cell loosening. So in essence, um, this, is, this, is, this is the summary of all of this thing. You see, I'm so nice. I find you the, 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 the shorter version of it. So number one, auxin increase the proton pump. Proton pump means it pumps in hydrogen. More hydrogen means more acidic. As simple as that. So when it becomes more acidic, cell wall becomes more acidic. It will start to loosening all these enzyme and cross-linking polysaccharides. Remember the three components of the cell wall? You have the cross-linking, right? Acidity will break this, will loosen this. Plus, with the action of expansin, separate microfibrils from cross-linking polysaccharides. Two things here. Yeah? Acidity plus expansin. Expansin is a special protein that is present in the cell wall. So the combination of these two will start to detach all of this loosen so it become loosen okay so when it becomes loosen then we will have this cleaving allows the microfibrils to slide so instead of tightly bound together now they are loosened then they can start to move like in this picture here originally super tight and then they become loosened, okay? So when they become loosened like this, these microfibrils can slide. See, it elongates, right? So when it elongates, and eventually, what will happen? Um, H, to stop this from happening, alkalization needs to take place. Acidity loosening up alkalization will stiffen back everything you want to achieve situation c so situation c can be achieved with wall alkalization which activates pme pme is uh it's, it's a protein actually pectin methyl transferase to create this pme the one that you see, P M E, pectin, methyl, transferase. It's basically, just activate the pectin thing. Okay, so when you have pectin, can the cell wall move? It's glue. It's glue. So when it's it it has become glued up. It will cause the cross linking of the poly polysaccharide and gross cessation. Okay, so 
when that happens, all of these will start to bind together. Okay, when they bind together, eventually the cell will start, will stop from elongating. Okay, and it will stay that way, maybe for a very long time, or until it's dead. Like in the case of xylem. Xylem is dead, but before it was dead, it was this, growing and elongating. Okay, and the final thing that determines cell growth, number one is the arrangement of the um, cellulose, which is in transverse or horizontal arrangement. Number two is the action of the auxin to loosen up the cell wall. And number three is the elasticity. So elasticity um, is basically whether the side of the cell is stiffer or softer, okay? It's not really important for many, uh, uh, most of the plants, but still important. So in this mapping here, you can see that the region where the part is softer, I'm uh, sorry, stiffer, it is less elastic. When it is less is elastic, it cannot elongate. So you can see here, the width of the cell wall here, which is the trans side of it, it's red, meaning that it is stiffer. The axial side of the cell here, it's not so red, meaning that it is softer. So th th this is why, okay, it is softer. So that's why it can elongate more on the axial side compared to the trans side, okay? This is, can be um, depicted by the action of the spring, you know? The spring, you know the, your spring? Your spring can be made from different material. Even though you have the same amount of weight at the bottom, some spring can be stretched easier than other, depending on the type of material. And the type of material in this trans side of the cell makes it more stiffer compared to the axial side. Okay, that's, a, that, that's why the modulus um, reading here, the indentation modulus here for the axial side, it is not very elastic. Okay. All right, so these are the things that enable your plant cells to grow and expand, okay? Elastic is uh, material and isotrophy, meaning that the way cellulose is arranged, okay, which is depend on the cell at the back. What, what is the name of the cell at the back here? The front here is your epidermis. What is the cell at the back? Cortical cells, cortical cell, okay? And also the elastic symmetry. And in addition to that comes auxin, okay? To loosen up everything, all right. All right, okay. So cell wall yielding under pressure is a property determined by its composition and structure, right? So material and isotropy determine the direction while the wall elasticity and stiffness different, um, determine the magnitude. How the direction means whether it goes up or down. The magnitude means how up or how down it will go. All right. So it's a combination of these two. Yay. And that is all. Get it? Okay. All good? Still breathing? Still breathing? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, oh, it should, 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 should be done. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I think that's all for, for, for today. So, um, so we'll resume your, um, what happened to your onion? Is it growing? Is it growing? Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll see your onion, um, this 
Thursday. Okay? All right. Okay. Any question before we go? All good? All good. Uh, I think we better go to the field, okay? Because um, we need to make a first week observation, okay? See what, what happens to you. And then, um, all right, okay. Um, I think if that's, that's not all, I think um, that's all for today. So thank you for coming. And I'll see you again later. Okay, all right, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, we need to replace. Oh. Do you have class after this? Yes. Uh, um, just five minutes. Um, we need to, you see, we have so many Mondays, holidays, and the, the latest addition to that strike is um, for the election, which effectively makes you are without classes for six weeks on Monday. Six. Okay, you, you, you got your Deepavali, your Christmas, your New Year, your Sultan Selangor birthday, and then you got your general election. Just so many of it. Okay. Um, can we have the replacement class um, sometime later, maybe after your semester break? I think we only need two. The maximum is three. We don't need to replace all of them because some of it I have told during the lab time. So why not you decide among you when you would like to have it? We can have it at night, okay? Um, is, is everybody okay if we do it at night? Uh, maybe Thursday night or Friday night? Online. Huh? Physical. Um, we, we do it physical. We do it physical. <laughs> Don't get used to online thing, okay? That really hamper your learning, okay? There is, there is a good reason why fac this faculty bans um, online on online class so much, okay? Uh, the faculty they don't ban it so much. This faculty they they, they ban it, okay? No, no, we we can do a few um, online thing, maybe just one or two more. Um, uh, that's why we don't have to replace all six classes. I only need two or three. Okay, and why don't you decide and then let me know during the lab time. Okay, we can be at night, we can, I, I mean like if it's on Thursday and Friday, my time is kind of flexible. All right, so we can do it. And yeah, most likely the class is not going to be here, but it's in the main campus. All right. Here is closed and nobody will come and, and open the door for you. Okay, we'll 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 do it uh, in the in the main campus. All right. Okay. So I think that's all. All right. Okay. I'll see you then. Okay. Bye. Okay.